Hello. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Just let the final stragglers find their seats, but we better kick off. Um, so thanks for coming for Screen Australia's talk about our Games Fund. I'd just like to start by um, acknowledging that our presentation today is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Cool. So... Before we get too far into it, we'll just introduce ourselves. So I'm Amelia, I'm Games Investment Manager at Screen Australia. I started just recently in May. Before that, I was doing a bunch of different roles, mostly in production, product management, marketing, and a bit of narrative and design. When you're in indie, you know, you wear many hats, so a little bit of everything, and I'll just pass over to Lee. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Um, my name's Lee, I'm the Head of Online and Games. Some of my CV there. So I started as a creator in a group called The Axis of Awesome, doing silly songs for people around the world. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mum. Um, still, still got it. Um, uh, then uh, one of the projects that I took was kind of a spin-off of that was a, a web series called Insert Coin, which was a sketch series about video games that uh, my, myself and my colleague Jordan created together and then started here in Screen Oz in 2018. Um, and so Games has kind of recently been reintroduced to Screen Australia and it comes under the online and games department. So what is a Screen Australia? Um, obviously there's state-based funding bodies. You may be familiar with them if you're you know, here in Victoria or in other states. We're the federal equivalent. Um, our mission is to support the development, production and promotion of screen content. Uh, that now includes games. Um, most of the agency is devoted to obviously film, television, uh, the online department is really growing um, and we've been kind of focused on you know, web series, um, you know, TV projects, XR for the last few years, but we've recently re-entered games as of this year. Um, as I said, there's plenty of state agencies who are doing fantastic work, most of them have some great games funding offerings uh, depending where you are. There's also you know, trade, investment and growth agencies out there in most states, creative and innovation agencies, Create Victoria here, who are part of this event as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we fit into the picture. Um, throughout this presentation also, you can enjoy some pictures of some of the games we've funded or that we've been involved in, in the past. So uh, that's what those pictures are. Cool, so to expand a little bit on what Lee mentioned about uh, this isn't the first time we've funded games. As a lot of you are probably aware, we did have some games funding back in 2012 through 2014. Um, so this was a really ambitious uh, amount of games funding and of it there was 6 million rolled out in enterprise funding, 3.8 in game production which is similar to the fund we've got now so that means investment in a project. Enterprise funding is basically investment in a business rather than in a project so it's a bit larger scale. And we also uh, dedicated 120k of sector building initiatives so this is for things like GCAP or other community based events that have a positive impact on the screen industry. Um, so can anybody tell me <laughs> what these four pictured games have in common based on that? No? They all received Screen Australia funding of some description. <clears throat> so, very humble about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess we just put it there to show that um, we know the impact that funding can have because obviously these are all recognisable game titles. So whether it was through enterprise or a bit of production funding, we know. And we both also used to be creators and we've both received funding as creators. So we know how far a, a little bit of investment can go. Um, earlier this year, we had round one of the Games Expansion Pack Fund, which is what we're primarily here to talk about. Uh, just to recap, the fund opened back in April, was open for about six to eight weeks, and even given that really short amount of time for applications, we got 106 el eligible applications. Um, and of that, 30 games were funded to the tune of just over $4 million. <coughs> so really exciting start. There was a lot of demand in that first round, and we're really excited uh, now that the fund is reopened to see what we get. So here's a bit of a reel of some of the games that we funded in that first round.
roll. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as a side note, you can play some of those demos over the course of GCAP in the Screen Australia Locals Lounge. So some of those titles that were pictured there, if you want to play a demo, see the kind of, you know, where those games are up to, uh, please go and check those out over the course of the next couple of days. Um, so as Amelia said, we're going to talk mostly about the Games Expansion Pack Fund uh, for the next little while, but I just wanted to mention another fund that is open to games to the games industry. That's our Industry Partnerships Fund. That's open all year round. Um, and as you can see there, you can apply for up to 30 grand for kind of events that will significantly benefit the Australian screen industry. There need to be domestic events here in Australia. Um, for example, our partnership for GCAP is to provide that Screen Australia local lounge uh, here at this conference. So, you know, we're trying to open that fund up to more gaming related events as we're kind of back in funding for games. Yep, cool. Um, so, some kind of headlines about Games Expansion Pack. This is all on the website in the guidelines. Um, we've got a podcast episode you can listen to about our funding as well, but just to kind of whip through some of the kind of top line information about the fund. Um, we are separate to the incoming digital games tax offset. Um, so, those projects eligible for that have a budget of 500 grand or above. Projects eligible for the Expansion Pack Fund have a budget of under 500 grand. You can apply for up to $150,000 worth of funding on any kind of platform, any genre. You saw obviously a huge range of genres in that sizzle reel. I guess it's helpful to know what we won't fund, and that's games that aren't classifiable in Australia. Um, so there's more info on that website as well. We're specifically focused at small to medium independent Australian companies. So what do we mean by that? The small to medium is defined by the budget that I mentioned earlier, of that kind of under 500 grand for the project you're applying for. Uh, independent, can't be listed on the Australian Securities Exchange and not majority owned or controlled by an overseas company. Um, and the game needs to be primarily developed in Australia and under the creative control of those key creatives who are Australian citizens or permanent residents. Uh, if you want to know what we assess your projects on, again, we're a government agency, so we have to be transparent on that. The things that we look at when we're looking at your projects, the creativity and the entertainment value, the budget, the finance and the development plans, the marketing and release plan, super important, and we've got a lot of info on that later on in this talk. And then how the project reflects the gender equity and all the diversity of people and experiences from around Australia. Obviously, we want to be here to uh, open doors for people who maybe haven't had access to funding or who haven't believed that funding was maybe relevant to them in the past. So that's one of our key goals as well with this fund. Cool. So let's get into the meat of what we need from you in order for you to submit an application so the first thing is the prototype. So we need a playable prototype, but to be clear, this doesn't have to be a vertical slice. We're keenly aware that it takes time and money to make a prototype, so we're not expecting it to be fantastically polished. That being said, if you do have a vertical slice, of course, it functions as a great prototype, so you can send us that. Uh, but you can send us other things as well. Basically, the point of the prototype is to, I guess, prove to us that you can do what you've said you're going to do in your application. So if there's a part of your application that is really, really ambitious and um, maybe something that doesn't line up as clearly with your background, that's probably the part you want to show us in the prototype the most. So a great example is one of our funded games, um, which is called Fox and Shadow. This comes from a team that have a lot more tabletop experience and they have video game experience, but they've formed a team um, with some video game experienced folk to make a game. And so one of our greatest questions with this application was, are they going to be able to make a video game even though they've had successful, you know, tabletop Kickstarter? And so they'd submitted a prototype which was essentially a um, proof of the central mechanic, like the gameplay mechanic, really unpolished, really grey boxed, but it showed that they could do a turn-based system in a video game really well. So it can be that sort of thing. Um, if your game has got some crazy art style and you want to show us a test of that working, in your game, that's something you could submit as well. It's really whatever you want it to be. But crucially, we also ask for something called the prototype details document. And the purpose of this is to give you a chance to contextualize what your prototype is, because we know there's going to be a gap between your full game and what your prototype is. And the prototype details, it sounds complicated, but it's really just an A4 page with like a few pieces of information about what we're looking at when we look at your prototype. And key to that, is the description of the intended experience. So this is basically like, what, what am I looking at here? How, how early is this? What does this represent in terms of your full product versus what you're showing us in the prototype? So we like to see that. Um, other things in the details document, really straightforward. 
what is this game for? <laughs> is it for a PC? If so, what specs do we need to be able to run that? If it's VR, what headset is that for? Just those sorts of basic things. Um, step-by-step -step instructions to get it running and a uh, controller map or just a list of what buttons do what in your build. Um, we get a lot of applications, so the less time that we have to spend like bashing the keyboard trying to figure out how to move in your prototype, the better. Uh, we also ask for 30 seconds of gameplay capture. This is mostly insurance in case your build isn't working as, in, as intended, because if we have capture that you've made, it, it doesn't have to be a fancy thing with you talking over it. It's literally just 30 seconds of the build running. We know what it's supposed to look like when it's working. So that gives us a good benchmark to be able to compare what we've got going on our console or computer or whatever to what you've done. So now I'm going to talk about the most exciting part, the finance plan and your budget. Um, we provide all this information in a template on the website, so if you don't grab a copy of this, that's all there in down, you know, on, on that template. Um, just as a quick kind of top line, the budget is the line-by-line -line breakdown of how you're going to spend the money to make the game, and the finance plan is where that money is coming from, those sources of funding for that game. There's a few kind of definitions of those funds. Crucially, I want to just highlight the first and the third ones. Grant money is essentially money that you get from a uh, source that isn't repayable. You don't need to pay that back and investment is money that you do need to pay back that is recoupable in some form. And the good news is that our funding for expansion pack is all in grant form. We don't need or want the money back. Please don't give us the money back. <laughs> Please spend the money and make a great product. Um, but yeah, there's obviously other definitions there, but that's all in that template. Just want to whip through a kind of example of a finance plan. This is a dummy one that we've mocked up, but just to kind of give you a sense of what they look like. It's not terribly detailed. Some of them might literally be one line item of Screen Australia contribution funding. It might be a couple. That applicant contribution is pretty common to see. That's your kind of, um, your in-kind, your sweat equity, your labour in the game. But we do define that as when money has changed hands. So if that's just you working on this game in your spare room for years and you haven't paid yourself, that doesn't need to be in the finance plan. But if there is money in that finance plan, in that project that has changed hands or has been paid, that's when you put it in this document for us to see how much money's been spent. Otherwise, our budgets for these games would start to, you know, eclipse 500 grand pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, essentially, just tell us where the money's coming from, tell us whether it's confirmed or pending, and let us know when you expect that to, to drop if it is pending. And one more thing I'll clarify, because it's a question we usually get, is whether there's a minimum amount you must contribute to the game versus what we're contributing. There is no minimum. If your game can be made for the amount of money you're asking us for, that could be the entire budget. Obviously, there's lots of risk associated with that because that's just one source, um, but you can just ask for the money from us. Yeah. Another common question, how much should I ask for from Screen Australia? It can be up to 150K, but it should be what you need um, from, from us to make that game. So... You know, don't feel like you're going to be more or less competitive by asking for more or less. We put that back on you. Bit of an example of a budget here. Uh, don't need you to kind of look at this in detail. It's probably pretty small back there. But um, essentially, this is kind of what we ask for, the level of detail we expect. We don't expect all of these line items to be filled out. These are just some, I guess, starting points or things to inspire you to think about wh where you should be spending your money on your game and telling us about it. In terms of the level of detail we want, for example, we ask for something, you know, in that middle column, licenses, um, down in software and licenses. That's as detailed as we need. We don't need to see licenses for this sound effect, licenses for opening theme song, licenses for clown noise. That's all just, um, you know, can come under licenses. So we don't need that level of granularity, but we want to see that, um, you know, some of these things are in your budget as you go on to develop the game. Crucially, a couple of things that we do like to see, um, all of the, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too, but we like to see your application all make sense together. For example, if your marketing and release plan lists a bunch of activities, that should be reflected in your budget in that marketing and PR um, part of the budget. And we like a contingency. So a contingency is your rainy day money. For a bit of context, on a film or TV project, some places require there to be a minimum 10% contingency of your, of your budget um, that's your kind of production spend in that budget. So you should be thinking along those lines. It doesn't have to be that much but you should have some money in case of emergency, in case of things that are unforeseen. That's okay, and we do regular cost reporting with you, um, which again is all in the template, so we see how that money gets spent over the course of developing the game. So crucially, make sure you put some of that money aside for anything and everything that could go wrong uh, as you develop your game. 
Okay, so next up we have the development plan. We don't provide a template for this because as you sort of saw from our sizzle reel, we fund all sorts of different genres and types of games. Some of them are a team of one, some of them are a, you know, a bigger team of, of contractors coming in and out. Um, so every game has different needs. What we do ask for at a minimum is some milestones and some sort of timeline or schedule. So the milestones in your development plan can be, they can be as many as you like, but in your application form to, ask, to us, we ask for sort of three major things, um, which are to do with when you will be paid the money if um, your application is successful. So the first one in the application form is close of contracting. This is essentially your best guess of, of when contracting would happen if you got funded. So you can just put three or four months from the time of application and we can alter that as needed. But importantly is the midpoint milestone and the release milestone. So midpoint is usually something like an alpha or beta milestone. You can sort of decide based on what where your project's at. Projects come to it as to come to us at all different times. So the reason that we don't call it an alpha or a beta is because maybe a solo dev has come to us with something really early and it's going to take them two years to make it. Maybe someone has come to us with a game that's only got five months left on it and they just want some money to get to the end of the road. Then they're probably already hit some kind of beta and they're going to, you know, be a lot closer. So that's why we don't give that a firm name. And then release is when you plan to release your game. And this can be an early access release or some sort of open development release. It doesn't have to be um, your final release. So that's the milestones. It's very high level. The timeline and schedule is more granular and it should communicate what's going to happen when, what is the known work remaining, what roles are needed to do that work? So the reason I say roles and not people is because we all know that in small teams, people wear many hats. So it's much better for you to indicate like what work is it um, rather than just breaking things up by people because that doesn't really tell us like what, what's the nature of the work as much. You could do both, but I guess what I'm trying to say is like more detail is better in these things. What we want to know is that you know what it's going to take to finish this game and you've done your best guessing possible as to how long and what resources that's going to take. Um, there is ambiguity in every project. <laughs> um, the best thing you can do around ambiguity is tell us about it. Tell us that you're already aware what the ambiguity is and how you plan to address it. So really common thing, risks, a basic risk assessment. Risk assessment sounds really scary, but it can be as simple as a list of things that you think could go wrong with your project and then corresponding answers of what you would do. So really common things for game projects. Your game engine issues a major update and you have to update the whole game project in order to be compliant with some platform requirements, something like that. That could happen to anyone's game at any point in time. So if that happens, what are you going to do? Tell us. Um, illness within the team. I could go on. There's plenty of things, but let us know what those things are. If there is ambiguity that you can't put a name on, add time buffers. If you think you're going to need more time, give it to yourself nice and early. Um, if there's a role not yet filled, especially if it's like a key role, Tell us how you plan to fill that. If you've talked to people, if you have people in mind, that's great for us to know. I've got a list there of sort of common mistakes of things that people don't put in their development plan. Um, this isn't necessarily, uh, you know, a perfect list of everything you should do, but it's definitely stuff that during round one um, we would be surprised not to see. I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, the self-publishing thing I think is a really good one to keep in mind. If you don't have a publisher, even if you're not looking for one, then there's a bunch of work that needs to be in your development plan somewhere along the line. So, yeah, definitely think about that. Cool. So another piece of uh, submission material we ask for is a video pitch. And I want to just talk about that for a minute because even in the space that I work in a lot online, web series, people aren't necessarily familiar with that. Um, sometimes people don't love video pitches, but I'll tell you, we love getting them and we love seeing them because in an ideal world, we'd be able to sit down with everyone who's applying, hear about your project, have a coffee, get that pitch in person. Obviously, we can't do that. So the video pitch is your chance to tell us about your projects in your own words. Uh, it's often the first thing we look at when in your application, and we like to leave that video pitch. We like it to finish and to have a decent understanding of what your game is. Um, you don't need high production values for it. In fact, I would encourage you not to. I watched one the other day for a web series where it was literally one take of a guy out early in the morning on a farm just talking to a phone and it was three minutes long and it could have been 20 minutes long and I would have loved it just as much. It was fantastic and really engaging. He clearly thought about it. He clearly had scripted and rehearsed what he was going to say so then he could do it in one take really articulately and really, really um, impressively. It can be that. I've seen great video pictures that are, you know, footage with people talking over the top of them if you don't love being on camera. 
it's kind of open, but really, like I said, we want to know what your project is. And crucially, we want to see your version of enthusiasm and excitement for that project. So that can be in any form. It doesn't have to be high energy, screaming at the camera, loud graphics and rock and roll music. Uh, rock and roll music, one of my 40. Um, <laughs> yes, I am. Thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> But whatever enthusiasm looks like to you, we want to see that. And that, that's contagious, right? When you're talking about something and you're passionate about it, that, you can't help but feel that. Because often it's our job to take your project and pitch that to our bosses. So you've got to kind of get us on board and pitch to us so that we're excited for your project. Um, some things of what are really important to cover in that, just so you've kind of ticked those boxes and it's helpful to think about. Um, you know, the vision for the project, the intended audience for the project, what's going to be hooky and sticky and really exciting about that project for the audience. Um, and what's our money, our funding going to do for that project? What's the impact of that funding? Um, we've got an FAQs document on the website, on the guidelines page as well, that covers a bit more info on pitch documents as well, on pitch videos, sorry, as well. So, um, yeah, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of info on pitch videos. So the last one we're going to talk about in detail is the marketing and release plan. There's a lot that I could say about this, but I'll try to keep it brief. The key message I'd like you to take away, if nothing else, is that a small number of good marketing streams is better than a large number of bad ones. So what do I mean by this? It's just like development. Don't try to do everything. Scope is queen. Scope a marketing and release plan that is realistic for your team's ability and budget. I would encourage you to try to think about this as the same lens that you think about development. So if somebody, somebody came up to you at something like GCAP and they were like, I'm going to make an MMORPG by myself with my three other student friends and it's going to be amazing, it's going to have all these features and it's going to be online for the next five years. You know, everyone is, is terrified <laughs> of what's going to happen to that team. Um, they're going to burn out, they're not going to be able to do it all, they're not going to be able to deliver on everything. This was a really strong theme that we saw in the marketing release plans in round one was teams pitching marketing release strategies that were way too complicated and demanding for their team, often with nobody clearly identified to do that work or an attitude of being able to get somebody at the last minute to do all of that work. That's not realistic. Uh, you need to scope something that works for you and works for your project. The other thing that's really important is that you're actually the expert of your game's hooks. You're the one that knows what the secret source is. You know what the, the magic is that thing that you're trying to hook us with in the pitch video to tell us like why you wanted to make this game, that's what will sell your game. <laughs> so you need to think about how to communicate those things to people and you actually know that best. So it's fair enough to bring someone else in to work on that, but you're still gonna have to explain it to them for them to carry that message. So you do need to really think about this. Um, so the marketing release plan should make clear what are those hooks, um, who would be interested in those, Psychographic, I'm going to talk about what that means in a second, and how do you reach those people. Use your creativity. Everybody who is an indie is extremely creative and is capable of doing many different things. Marketing is a form of storytelling. You're just pitching to a different audience at a different time. So I would really encourage you to tackle your marketing um, and release plan with creativity. So a great example is like if you're doing a story-driven game, you could do choose-your-own-adventure style content on TikTok or on Twitter or something like that where you post a little bit of a story and then people vote and then you keep doing the story based on what they what they say, you know, like there's, I could give a lot of examples, but I don't know your game as well as you do. So you need to think about that. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of the common mistakes. Uh, feel free to take a picture of that. Um, but one that I would really like to point out is no mention of localization strategy. You should be aware of like the genre that you're making for and where that genre is popular because um, some genres are really popular in certain regions and you're really shortchanging yourself if you have no awareness of that in your plan. If you have a publisher, fair enough, they're probably gonna be doing that thinking for you, but if you don't, you know, 10 minutes of Googling different Steam tags and what's popular where, and this information is available. Um, so I would encourage you to look at it. And speaking about Steam, <laughs> um, here's a horrible, terrifying graph about why <laughs> it's important to have a marketing release plan and a strategy at all. So back in the, you know, the golden age when indies started being on Steam, there were only a couple of hundred games being sold and you could just kind of make a game and put it on the internet and hope for the best because there just weren't that many. But as you can see here, last year there were 10,000 games released on Steam alone. Um, so this is why we really have to think carefully about how to stand out now and how to find our audiences. Okay, so psychographic profiling. So when I mentioned before about 
who your audience is. We're not as interested in demographics as we are in psychographically who you think will play your game. So demographics are probably what you traditionally associate with marketing, where people are like, we're going to market this you know, Mario Kart to boys who are between the years of 8 and 12 years old or something like that. Um, these days, the sort of more effective way to think about audiences is their motivation. <clears throat> and this is sort of something that is more relevant to games and other areas of marketing because there is so much information about what motivates people. So if you are making a um, game with a lot of collectibles, rather than saying, we think this will appeal to you know, 12-year-old girls, maybe you could say something like, we think this will appeal to the same sort of people that play Pokemon because that's also about collecting things. And then you could think about, well, what motivates people to play Pokemon based on these things? And what sort of activities would appeal to those people in a promotion? You know, like maybe they like merch. Maybe you could make something and you're at five different events and if they go to all of them, they get some sort of pin that, I don't know, is special to your game. So think about the things that motivate your player. That will help you find where they are, but it will also help you develop marketing streams that will appeal to them. Um, you can kind of see up here what these are, but these are just a few different uh, models of thinking about motivation. So the one up the top left, Bartles one, that's a really old school one, but it's still good to think about. Uh, the Quantic Foundry one is really great. Their website is awesome. If you have no idea where to start, definitely recommend checking that out and reading more about that. Uh, and then um, Amy Jo Kim's one, if you think about all of the games that are most popular ever, they're all games with social aspects, stuff like Minecraft, stuff like WoW, that people, you know, Fortnite, it, it's all socially driven. So this is a matrix that's just actually about social interactions. So something else good to think about. Um, and if you have no idea, if you're thinking that everything I'm saying sounds like gobbledygook, then here is where I recommend you start. Um, so these are just a few resources that I recommend to people if they don't know where to start. The two on the right are written by or made by Australian folks um, who know a lot about marketing and release. And then the two on the left are, are a bit bigger. They are communities as well as newsletters. So if you get into the communities of either of those spaces, you'll very quickly start to be exposed to all the sorts of information around like marketing release strategy. So yeah, recommend checking those out if you're not sure where to start. Leave that up for one more second if anyone wants to take a photo. <laughs> and gone. Um, cool. So finally, um, before I just delve into this, I, I'm not sure if we mentioned earlier, but the fund is open now and its applications are rolling, which means they're open until end of this financial year. Well, we're going to close them on the 4th of May and you'll hear back from us. Once we've got your prototype up and running, we get back to you within five to seven weeks with the results. So we're going to be making decisions throughout the next kind of few months before the 4th of May. So we've, we've done that rather than having a round with a really tight deadline like we did in the first half of the year, we want you to apply to us when your game is ready. So when you've you know got that prototype ready to go and within that time. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of some other things to do to learn more about the fund, a really good thing to do is have a look up some of the funded games that we've uh, you know we've funded in the first round, or as I said earlier, you can play some of them today, tomorrow. There's different games each day uh, over the next three days in the local lounge. Um, just kind of demos of, of where those projects are up to. Um, but yeah, it's good to get a sense of like what we've funded in the past and where your project sits alongside those, or if it's really similar to something we've funded, it might be worth having a think about what's your point of difference. Um, we have official guidelines on the website. Um, obviously, great to read them, and that kind of gives off this information in really handy government form. Uh, I mentioned the FAQs earlier, and then we've also got a podcast episode that's 20 minutes long with the two of us talking about the fun, probably saying a lot of the same things that we did today. So if you want a refresh of that, um, really recommend that you sign up for the Screen Australia newsletter. Um, that's absolutely a plug for that newsletter, but it's only fortnightly, and that's where all of our funding is announced, all of our funding decisions are announced, new initiatives... So that's a really handy way just to keep in touch with what's going on. Um, and when things are announced first, they'll be in that newsletter. Um, and follow us on social medias. And if you want to, uh, email us, games at screenaustralia.gov.au. And I would encourage you to reach out to us. We're both based here in Melbourne, but we travel as much as we can. We have Zoom talks and phone calls with people all over the country. Our remit is to fund games from all over Australia and we love to talk to people about their games. That's actually one of the best parts of our job is to sit down with people either over Zoom or phone or in person and hear about what you're working on, hear about where you're up to, um, maybe let you know that you might be ready to apply for funding. You might need these pieces of puzzle or to think about these things. So we encourage you to reach out. 
we are the games team, so bear with us if it takes a little bit for us to get back to you. But um, we're really passionate about supporting games creators and developers in Australia and love to talk to people about their projects. Yeah, don't definitely don't feel like GCAP's the only time you can talk to us. We talk to people all the time, like just random email inquiries. We'll have a half-hour Zoom with them, talk to them about their project, phone call, whatever you need. So we're available sort of all year round, not just around this event. So do feel free to reach out, especially if you're quieter and you don't feel like you can talk to us at this event. Definitely encourage um, emailing us, please. Finally, before we delve into questions, there's some of the games we're demoing. And I believe one of the creators of Moonlight in Garland, up the top there um, has some giveaways and she might be around the local lounge around midday if you want some kind of giveaway and I'm being vague because I don't know exactly what <laughs> I'm talking about um, but hey it'll be fun to find out yeah and so in terms of where our room is if you go sort of past back past the registration desk keep going there's a bunch of um, stalls with um, people displaying stuff if you keep going there's like a coffee cart right up the end turn left and there's like a comfy room with bean bags and games that you can play. So that's that's the locals lounge. It's supposed to be a bit of a chill space if you need somewhere to relax between sessions or just have a chat with a friend. So definitely recommend you check that out. Um, we'll try to be there as much as we can. And yeah, thank you for listening and we'd love to hear if you have any questions. Um, if you do have questions, I think you need to come up to the mic if you could form a queue in the middle because this is being recorded and streamed and if you don't say your question to the mic, the poor people on the stream will not get to hear it. Um, so if people could just make their way up to the mic. We do have, I think, 10 or 15 minutes for questions because we thought you might have a lot. So <laughs> please come up if you've got one. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, f first question was just, is it important to feature Australian people or stories or places in the game itself? Like, does it need to be very focused on Australia? No, so you don't have to. Uh, for a lot of our other funding for film and TV, you do have to. We have something called uh, SAC, or Significant Australian Content, great acronym. Um, but yeah, there is no SAC quota. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a bureaucrat, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there isn't for games. So we do love, that being said, one of our remits of Screen Australia is to um, fund the telling of stories that reflect the diversity that makes up Australia. So if something is uniquely Australian, that is interesting to us, but it's by no means compulsory. So we kind of fulfil that sack quota in games by... It'll, it'll get funny again if we keep saying it. Um, <laughs> by funding games, as I said earlier, games that are made in Australia by primarily Australian citizens or residents. So that's yep. kind of the, the contention we make for games. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Morning. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. First one is, in the context of uh, failure or not getting funding, are you able to apply again afterwards? And is there a certain limit to how many times you're allowed to apply for a project? Yeah, so in this current round that's open, uh, yeah, we have a two-strike policy, so you can apply... Once, if you're declined, you can reapply. We do like to see what's changed and mm -hmm. taking that feedback on board within the second application. Um, and, yeah, then if you're declined a second time, um, look, by then we'll probably be at May anyway, but you can't reapply from that point. Okay, cool. But that's right. only specific to a to the actual funding time period itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's for this round. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. And it's also specific to a project, not oh, a company. Yeah. So okay. if you had a different project, you could bring that to us as well. Awesome. And then yeah. just quickly, the second one, talking about like ambiguity, mm. um, with regards to uh, your actual budget and stuff like that. So say I hypothetically was going to ask for $150,000 from you, but I was also potentially talking to a publisher that was maybe going to give me four hundred k but that wasn't locked in. Like, how do, you, how do you balance something like that? Because obviously getting the 150 from you is really helpful, especially yeah. if the 400 falls through, but then if I get the 400, I'm technically topping out that 500K limit. Mm, yeah, it's probably best to have a conversation with us about that. Okay. And, and I, I guess we, in that instance, we'd ask questions like, when do you expect to have an answer on that 400K? Yeah. I mean, look, the reality is we are aimed at games with a budget of 500K or less, we're aware that things shift and change and that, you know, maybe our funding helps get to you to a stage where a publisher comes on board and injects a, a whole bunch more money and it goes above that amount. We're not aiming for that to happen, but we're also not going to put a cap on that ambition and claw that money back. Um, so I guess that's just a conversation for us to have to see how likely that is mm -hmm. um, and, and, yeah, when you think that funding will be confirmed and maybe what you need from us to get to that point or, or from other sources. So, yeah, it's one of those, like, grey areas. That, that's like. perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think a good rule of thumb is, like, if you can see something being confirmed within the next two months, it could go on your finance plan. If it's earlier than that, 
it's probably not, you know, if it's six, 12 months out, that's too early. Awesome. Thank you for a great talk, by the way, uh, especially for the marketing tips, because my only one is a T-shirt. That's all I, all I know. <laughs> uh, but a question I have is, I guess, asking in the name of other solo indie developers, mm -hmm. does the budgeting work backwards? So if someone just spent two years building a game and releasing it on Xbox, can I claim some of the licensing that would be, whoops, that would be, I guess, back? Or is it just for the future localization, say, for the next console or whatever it might be? Yeah, ideally we're finding the work to come. Um, and I guess I'd go back to my point about if there was money that changed hands previously in the budget, yeah. then reflect that in, in the budget. Um, I guess it would depend, like, how, how whether that was that sweat equity or whether it's actually... Uh, and in terms of, like, what is the right time to come ask for mm. a funding, is it... If you are effectively published and all you would like to go after is, let's say, PlayStation, just another console, is that something that you guys can help with? Or? Yeah, so porting is eligible, but it's hard to make it competitive because uh, at Screen Australia, primarily what we want to do is fund the creation of original IP um, for Australian creators to sort of maintain and, and, you know, for them to have that as an, as an asset for themselves. And porting obviously doesn't involve the creation of new IP. It could maybe if it included like DLC or a new... Basically, you'd have to work pretty hard to make a porting application competitive. So what I mean by that is um, show us that there's an audience waiting there in terms of the marketing release plan. What audience validation have you done? If people are clamouring for your game to be on this other platform and you can show us that and you have a good plan for that and a good budget, then maybe that is competitive. But if you're just like, oh, my game didn't do very well and I'm just going to put it on another console and hope for the best, then, you know, that's obviously a less competitive application. So it is eligible. Um, and, yeah, also feel free to talk to us about it if you... Yeah, if awesome. you're not sure. Thank you so much. Uh, hi. Um, I think when I looked into this a few years ago, uh, I think there was a requirement that you be an actual company instead of like a sole trader, and that could be quite a, uh, a hurdle for, in, for for single people or small groups to overcome. It's going to be quite expensive to become a company. Is that still the case? It is, yeah, and I, I hear that feedback, and we have gotten that from the community a, a little bit. Um, I guess I would say uh, we need to draw a line somewhere. We It does make contracting a lot easier in terms of contracting with companies. Um, we are looking at kind of future schemes that may be open to sole traders. But at the moment, this fund is just open to proprietary limited companies. Yeah, it's definitely feedback that we've gotten a few times and we're hearing it and we're, yeah, we want to, we're working on that. Hi. Um, you mentioned with the contingency budgeting, you, you threw out the number like 10% for films. I'm wondering, is that a, um, is that kind of a fairly consistent number that 10% is a good amount? Or what would you, what would you say factors into where, how you budget for that? Yep. Uh, and maybe a follow-on from the, the, the mm. budgeting part is when you're looking at the overall budget, do you factor in where the, the Screen Australia money goes specifically into the overall budget or is it just some total of money in versus some total of money out and yep. it doesn't really matter what goes to where? Yep, so you, I'll answer your second question first because that's easier. You don't have to delineate where the Screen Australia money is going versus other sources of finance. It's just your overall um, the amount of the finance plan has to match the budget. Um, and your first question was about how much contingency. So what I would say is that you should, uh, it should sort of mirror how much risk and ambiguity there is in your project, right? So 10% is a great rule of thumb. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I saw one budget that had contingency in it <laughs> because it's I not- I saw one, I saw oh, one. Oh, you saw yeah, one, okay, yeah. awesome to that one team. Um, it's not something we're really taught to do as game developers. It's definitely something that we know about more from film and TV. But, um, yeah, I'd say start at 10%. But if there are significant risks or ambiguities in your project, like we want to ship this to a new VR headset and we have never developed for it before, but we think we've got a really good shot at it, that's the sort of thing where it's like more contingency is obviously better because you don't know what the costs are around that. So. And, and is that contingency just a blanket for, for blank all risks or would you say this is a contingency for this specific risk? Sort of up to you. Right. I think if you're saying this is contingency for this specific risk, then it's just another budget line item. Yeah. So contingency should be like unforeseen risks essentially mm -hmm. or we don't, we don't know specifically what this will go to. Yep. I, I would say 10% is pretty healthy. So yep. don't feel like you need to hit 10% for us to go, yeah, tick, that's a good budget. It's often less on a web series or something of a lower budget. That's just a, a guide to kind of go, that's how much money people in film put aside because so many things can go wrong. So start thinking about that kind of, oh, what, what could those wrongdoings be? Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. <laughs> hey, just wanted to know what the differences are with this round of funding as compared to the last round of funding. Yeah, sure. So... Uh 
it's pretty much the same. The things that we've changed are, uh, you used to be able to submit a video or a prototype, but what we found during the first round was that the games that didn't have a prototype really couldn't show themselves off as well as the ones that did have a prototype. So we sort of wanted to do that to level the playing field a bit. Um, and then the other change we made was the, uh, so we changed the template a bit for the finance plan and budget. It now has a cover sheet in it that explains what the terms are. So hopefully that's helpful to people. And we also added the uh, prototype details document. But apart from that, I think... We changed one of the assessment criteria as oh, well. Yeah, we so we now well. look more at um, kind of cultural and diversity and reflection of you know the experience of Australia. Um, and I guess the big one being that this is now rolling and you can apply and hear an answer yeah. with kind of that once you're eligible and we can play your demo within five to seven weeks, as opposed to the last round where it was like, everyone apply by this deadline and we'll make decisions in one big hit. Yeah. We'll make decisions as we go now. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, uh, follow up, are there any other plans for future rounds of funding or uh, programs? So many plans. Um, <laughs> nothing that we can share today or nothing announced at this point. This is the extent of our funding for games as well as that industry partnership fund I mentioned earlier. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering when we submit a budget, how married to that budget are we? Um, <laughs> obviously projecting what you're gonna spend money on 18, 24 months out um, can be a little bit of like tarot reading. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about what happens when we've read the cards wrong? Yeah, no, definitely. So that's a great question. A budget isn't an exact, um, you know, register of everything you're going to spend to make your game. It's your best guess. Um, so in terms of if it changes, we have, if you do get successfully funded, we have um, cost reports in the same spreadsheet that you submit with the finance plan and budget. Um, a budget is basically how you think you're going to spend the money and then a cost report is what you actually did. So what the cost report does is it imports all the exact same line items that you filled in in the budget and then they'll be, this is how much you said you were going to spend and you enter how much you actually spent and then it shows us, you know, what's remaining to be spent on that if there's new line items. Long story short, we know it's going to change. That's totally normal. We expect that to change. That being said, we do want you to sort of put in the work to give your best projections possible. So, for example... If you've said in your marketing release plan that you're going to go to PAX in two years' time and, you know, this is your whole plan in marketing, how you're going to do that, and then in your budget you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to spend for marketing. Well, you do know because you're going to go to PAX and you could look up this is how much flights and a com, and obviously that's going to change in two years, but we'd rather see that than not see it at all. So make your best guess. And I would say if big things change, then feel free to give us a call. That's what we're here for as kind of your project managers, your investment managers, and let us know. You don't have to let us know every little thing, but if there's something significant that's going to change and you want to kind of keep us in the loop, we love that. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for the great talk. It was very uh, illuminating. Um, my question is about, I guess, um, what's on the radar for future funding rounds. Um, so I've been told from colleagues and friends in France and the UK that if you're applying for funding there, in the next couple of years, uh, you need to start considering your environmental footprint, sustainability issues and things like that. Is that at all on your radar yet? Um, look, in terms of the bigger picture for future funding for games, this is what we've got at the moment and we can't talk about anything. We don't have anything that's <laughs> confirmed yet. You, okay. If you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll be the first to hear. Um, I think that's a really interesting point about sustainability. I think it's becoming more of an issue that's, that's a talking point. I know there are some organisations, I think they're called Sustainable Screen, that's getting a bit of traction. Um, and, and I guess that would be a Screen Australia-wide initiative if we were going to implement that kind of stuff. So in all honesty, I, I don't have any foresight for you on that other than um, you know we're trying to uh, allocate our funding based on uh, you know the ever-shifting tides of the world. Wow, could I be any vaguer with that? <laughs> um, so what you're saying is it wouldn't hurt to consider it, but... Yeah, uh, if that's a consideration no in your budget and in the way you're going to develop your game, then mm -hmm. I think that's totally valid to put in your, you know, in your documents and your applications, so we know that's, that's part of your methodology. Um, but as yet, we're not going to um, require you to do anything around that. I, I guess it would be something for us to consider to, if, if yeah. that's, you know, for the future, but... Yeah. Is that is that happening in those countries yet or just on the cards? Um, I have only heard that France is starting to maybe from next year, I think. But I think the European Union is looking at it pretty closely yeah, too. Yeah, UK is definitely at Gamescom. They had like a huge focus on, mm. on sustainability. So I think that's something they're moving towards. So, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, um, a few members of my team are foreign nationals. They live and they work remote with my company. 
So I was just, just wanting to get an idea of what you're looking at when you're looking at these companies. Maybe we're working with a lot of foreign contractors and things like that, and how you're going to be determining, basically, that we're mostly Australian. Yeah, look, our requirement for this fund is that 90% of our funding is spent in Australia on the development of the game. So if you have other sources of funding, and that's going to people in, who are not in Australia making the game, then that's valid. I guess, ideally, we would be upskilling the Australian games industry and, you know... Um, making those games onshore as much as possible. So it's a consideration, but I guess if 100% of your finance plan is, is just our money and you were going to spend 50% of that offshore, then that would mean you're ineligible. But Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks. Uh, just quickly, um, one aspect of game dev that hasn't, I don't think you haven't really touched is on live ops. Now, I know like some companies, like some of who I've worked with before, are very reliant on like, you know, free to play and just continually developing stuff like is um any part of like maybe post launch mm -hmm. stuff for like live ops can be considered for the funding especially yep. if it's like more of a significant update yeah it's it's eligible so live ops and games as a service style content is eligible uh dlc can be eligible so if you have a good post release strategy mm -hmm. that can be eligible but it's sort of the same as what i was saying around porting yeah. so if your game is sort of flubbing and you're like oh we'll just put out <laughs> heaps of skins and hope yeah. for the best yeah. obviously that's not a very competitive application but if you've released your game you know, you, uh, the keynote was about unpacking, say unpacking, we're like, yeah, yeah we're going to do some more levels and this is yeah. why and we have a validated audience. Obviously, that's more competitive. So, yeah, live ops is eligible. Yeah. Um, it's just around how you want to frame that as uh, coming to us for funding. Oh, cool. no, no, thank you. I um, think this needs to be the last question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, going off that one, um, just say you were releasing a DLC which meets the under 500k threshold, but your original game is not, mm -hmm. is that eligible? Mm. Yes, that's a really good question. A tricky one. And that ends our presentation. <laughs> um, no. um, yeah, we, we did encounter this. I feel like where we drew the line was that, yes, it is eligible. I'm sorry, it's a tricky one. Mm. Do you want to chat afterwards? I appreciate probably other people may want to know that, but it mm. probably needs a bit of um, you know unpacking to figure out what... Yeah, it would depend on the scale of the, the original game, I think. I think we'd probably have to have a conversation with you about it. So if you are in that position, I really encourage you to email us. We're happy to talk about it. So, yeah, we can talk to you after this. We'll probably head to the locals lounge after this. So if you do have more questions for us, we'll be over there. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, everyone.